Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Using USDA Foods in a Disaster Response. Speaking today, we have Anthony or Tony Wilkins, a program analyst in the Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch of the Food and Nutrition Service Food Distribution Division. Tony will be joined at the end by Kathleen Staley, the Branch Chief of the Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch, to help answer your questions. Let's get started. I'll hand it over to you, Tony. Thanks, Katie. Appreciate that. Well, good, good afternoon or good morning to everyone, um, depending on your location. This afternoon, we'll be discussing the use of the USDA foods in a disaster response. Uh, today's presentation is geared toward new staff who are involved with the disaster feeding process. Uh, for those that are joining us, that are experienced um, may already have a very firm knowledge of the process, but this may serve as a good review. As Katie stated, as, you, as we're going along, if you have questions, please type them in the question and answer box in the bottom, and Kathy will be reviewing those and we'll uh, field those questions at the end of the presentation. So uh, let's get started. So what we're looking at today is an overview of disasters. Um, we're going to talk about situations of distress, how to plan and prepare for both congregate and also for disaster household distribution, which is I'll be referring to as DHD as we move along, uh, the response process, and then the recovery and, and the end of the process. So for those that have been involved with disasters in the past, I think we can all agree that Every situation or disaster could be very different. What you'll see as we go along is USDA, USDA has flexibilities built in so we could be effective in meeting your state and local feeding needs. As far as disasters go, let's talk about the Stafford Act. Now, the Stafford Act provides authority for the federal government to provide assistance, including USDA foods, to states and territories during a declared major disaster and emergency. So when the President of the United States determines, based on FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency's feedback, evaluation, and recommendations, that federal assistance is needed, right, the President will issue a formal major disaster or emergency declaration. And that enables resources to be put into play uh, for certain designated areas. So when FEMA puts a, uh, a presidential disaster declaration together, there will be, will be a specific and unique declaration number assigned to that event. The distinction between a presidential major disaster declaration and emergency declaration is the disaster declaration provides a full range of long-term federal assistance programs for individual assistance to the individuals and families who have sustained, sustained losses due to the disaster and or public assistance, which can fund the repair, restoration, reconstruction or replacement of a public facility or infrastructure damage due to a disaster. On, a, on the flip side is an emergency declaration. And these are more limited in scope. And with these will have less or sometimes without any of the long-term federal recovery programs available that you will find in a major de disaster declaration. So in a situation of distress, this is when a natural catastrophe or other situation that has not been declared a disaster or emergency by the president, but the determination has been made by the state or FNS that warrants the use of USDA foods. And a good example of this would be a situation of distress such as localized flooding or perhaps a blizzard that did not meet a declaration status within a widespread area. So FNS may replace USDA foods used in a situation of distress only to the extent that the funds are available. As you can see on the slide here, FNS has three primary methods to respond. So the first one is in an emergency, 
and disaster feeding organizations in these areas, such as the American Red Cross and the Salvation Army, may use on-hand inventories of USDA foods that are currently stored at state, local, and school warehouses. Like FEMA, these organizations are designated to respond immediately following a disaster. USDA does not warehouse or set aside any food specifically used for disasters. So these are in stock or foods already in place. To use USDA foods for congregate feeding or disaster household distribution, SDA, state distributing agencies, uh, Indian tribal governments, and disaster relief organizations should be familiar with the regulations. So at the last slide at this presentation, you will see Southern CFR 250.69 and 7 CFR 250-70, which is a situation of distress. Uh, they, those links will put you, uh, give you more information on each one of those. FNS may authorize the Disaster Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, known as DSNAP, when the president declares a major disaster with individual assistance. And that can be done under the Stafford Act. But in this situation, with DSNAP, states must request approval from FNS to issue DSNAP in these affected areas. Now, DSNAP is generally approved in disaster areas where the food supply chain has not been interrupted. In other words, electricity, power is on, grocery stores are open, so disaster survivors can use their DSNAP EBT cards to go in and purchase food. Now, on the next slide here, we're, we're talking about planning and preparation. And to me, this is probably the most important part. Before a disaster hits, you need to make sure you got a plan in place. So state distributing agencies should be prepared. And it's important to develop a plan in writing, detailing out who, what, where, when, and why, basically your communication plan. And it's going to detail out the operation and ex execution of how you're going to take care of things that need to be taken care of. Now, when you, once you make this plan, you need to make sure you're developing and sharing it with all your stakeholders. Uh, each SDA should become familiar with their state's emergency operation plan for disasters and multi-agency feeding plans in that area, in that state. So you should under, understand, fully understand and know the role of all the players in the disaster. In addition to that, you need to make sure you're training staff. Annually would probably be a good idea, but you need, uh, and also you need to make sure you're thinking too deep when you're making this plan together. Somebody's out sick or on vacation, you want to make sure there's somebody to fill in on that role. Most important would be maintaining a current listing of 24 7 emergency contact numbers. We're not always at work, but you know, we need to know how to contact each other after hours because normally that's when most emergencies seem to happen is outside of business hours. So uh, we recommend that state, local agency include also include a plan on how to reroute food in case of a need. So when you're thinking about your planning, we strongly encourage SDAs to establish a disaster response team. So, and when you're doing that, you should be thinking about developing relationships with state and federal emergency management contacts, such as your ESF-6, ESF-11, and with FNS, regional office staff. So they're also involved in, the, in this process. The federal government and many state organizations um, set up their response resources and capabilities uh, under the ESF or the Emergency Support Function concept. ESF are groups of organizations that work together to deliver core capabilities and support an effective response. Most federal ESF support a number of response core capabilities and bring together the capabilities of the federal departments. So an ESF-6 would encompass mass care, 
emergency assistance, temporary housing, and human services. Uh, ESF, ESF 11 will encompass agricultural and natural resources, which include the support of feeding. ESF 6 and 11 work together on other entities, such as including national level non-governmental organizations, such as the Red Cross and the Salvation Army. So we talked about uh, planning and preparation. Again, we highly encourage to provide disaster training to your local programs also which would include schools or school food authorities and food banks. Again, training should include how you're gonna roll out this process and also what things need approval during a disaster. Most important, record keeping, keeping track of USDA foods and then maintaining those contacts and communications when the disaster is, is ongoing. During a presidentially declared disaster and emergencies of distress, congregate feeding is most common form of food assistance. So the SDA may approve the use of USDA foods from current inventories to be used by a disaster feeding organization to supplement the foods being used to prepare meals in large quantities and served in a central location, such as a de designated disaster share shelter. During this recent pandemic, due to social distancing, requirements for congregate feeding was not appropriate in this circumstance. So instead, feeding organizations used mobile kitchens and soup kitchens to prepare meals, which were either delivered to individual or picked up by individuals and then taken home to be eating. Congregate feeding just in that situation was not an option. So it was a take home option. The SDA must notify FNS that congregate feeding used in US food is being provided and the period of time it is expected to be needed. So keeping FNS in touch with what's going on uh, is, is critical. And sometimes on big events, weekly calls are set up so that would be um, communicated. Um, the SDA may extend the period of time for assistance, but if they are, they need to uh, notify FNS of their intentions. So with a presidentially declared event, FNS guarantees replacement of the food. In a situation of distress, the SDA has the authority to release U.S. foods for congregate feeding, but only if the situation is a natural event and you can't do it for any more than 30 days. If it's not a natural event, FNS National Office must approve and determine the duration of assistance. USDA foods will only be replaced if the funds are available in that situation of distress. So when you're using state and local inventories of food, use um, what's in stock first. Congregate meals may be provided to emergency relief workers at the feeding site who are directly engaged in providing relief assistance. So that was a question that came up earlier. Yes, the, emer the emergency relief workers uh, can be provided meals. Uh, the application and approval of congregate feeding. The state distributing agency uh, must, uh, must review and approve it as a disaster or organization's application. So. If you need, there's a need out there, somebody needs to put the paperwork in so it can be um, reviewed. But that needs to be done uh, before the process starts. So here's one of the things we're looking for. You need to tell us a description of the disaster situation, an estimate of the number of people who are going to be needing meals, the period of time that you believe this is going to be ongoing, the quantity and types of food needed, and the number of location and sites providing the meal services. It's not just one program that provides the USDA foods. There's a many sources of USDA foods for congregate feeding and including the standard case products, which some people used to call brown box back in the day. You also have um, processed foods, foods that may have been uh, bought bulk chicken and now they're bulk chicken nuggets now or USDA DOD fresh fruits and vegetables. 
I know a lot of people use their entitlement money for that. And yet, and it doesn't always have to be industrial size, in, size cans, you know, the 610 cans. It could be household size uh, units that are used also. So keep that in mind. So for disaster household distribution, again, DHD, um, DHD requires the national office approval in advance. FNS will consider approval of disaster household distribution if the following circumstances exist in the disaster area. DHD household size USDA foods are distributed to individuals and households who use food to prepare and eat the meals at home versus at our congregate feeding site. So FNS national office must approve the state's request for DHD before requesting additional USDA foods for DHD, the state must use available local and state agency inventories. Disaster household distribution and DSNAP can be uh, distributed simultaneously, but the catch is you can't do it within the same household. Congregate feeding can run simultaneously with both, D with both DHD and DSNAP caveat is it just can't be within the same household. With the um, DHD, the request for the disaster household distribution, the uh, again, you need to provide us with some information, the description of the disaster, number of people, uh, pretty much the same scenarios we mentioned earlier. And I think the most important part here would be the method of distribution. Uh, it, like I said, in the very beginning, each disaster is very unique. So uh, it could be a variety of different ways that you handle each disaster. But your projection up front is, uh, is it tells us the story of, of how you want to need to operate your plan. So now's the time to respond. Establishing your, these and maintaining those uh, communications that you previously set up is critical during this time. At this point, you should deploy and, and use your disaster response team in conjunction with your local, state, and federal teams to coordinate your relief effort. Now, it's very important to notify suppliers as soon as possible, including your USDA food de deliveries, if you have a need to delay, cancel, or reroute deliveries. So let's say it's a hurricane like we've recently seen uh, and roads are closed and uh, impassable, and you've got loads supposedly coming in in the next few weeks, or, and you need to stop the loads, you need to pick up the phone and call us and let us know how you, how you want to handle that uh, in that interim period. You're in the response period now. Your Things are happening, things are moving. Uh, everything uh, that is used as far as USDA foods is concerned is uh, in case quantities. So you, there's some record keeping requirements. Um, you're going to situations you say, well, I'm going to get replacement or maybe I don't want replacement of USDA foods. Either way, record keeping is, is required. So we need to know material code numbers, case quantities of what's being um, distributed out. And this is, and we'll go into the slide in a few minutes, but it, you'll be reporting back of these results. So this not only applies to congregate feeding, but also for disaster household distribution. So here's the reporting part, the FNS 292, and this is done through FIPPERS. Um, so I think we all know that no job's done till the paperwork is done. So after you shut down uh, or termination of a disaster assistance, then you got 45 days to send in your FNS 292 report of commodity distribution for disaster relief. So uh, you will need to have online access to get into the food program reporting system. It's known as FIPRS, F-P-R-S. And again, even though you may not be requesting replacement of USDA foods, it's required that you fill out and submit um, this form. And so make sure you got set, whoever needs to have 
uh, access to, on the state level to enter these, this information into FIPRS is they have access. And uh, at the end of this, you have a contact name, uh, email, web address if you do not have uh, access to FIPRS and so you can get support to get that uh, added in. Sometimes when you're completing this final report of what's been distributed, but the material item number of that particular case may not be in the system. If it's not, you will reach out to Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch, and we will have to go in and get that corrected in the system. 99% uh, of the time, the number, the material item number is in there, but uh, sometimes it's not. Um, replacement of USDA foods used to provide congregate feeding or disaster household distribution under a presidentially declared disaster or emergency declaration is guaranteed by FNS. So remember, if it's a presidential declaration, the food replacement is guaranteed. But if it's a situation of distress, we will try to uh, replace only to the extent that uh, FNS funds are available. In addition to keeping up with your cases, there's also a, uh, an option to get reimbursed for potential transportation costs. Let's say you're moving food around from uh, due to the disaster, you can get reimbursed. What you'll do is you will submit a FSA 21 public voucher. And what you want to do when you're filling out the voucher is keep up uh, um, documentation, including your receipts. Might be fuel receipts for diesel fuel for your trucks. And it'll ask you for, you know, the invoice, the bill of lading, how much product was. Um, moved around. So keep up with those records. Uh, and in return, once we, the uh, regional office receives this documentation, they'll forward it over to the national office for reimbursement. Uh, the disaster manual FNS provides is going to have great detail in this whole process. So yes, there is a, a manual I would highly recommend if you're involved in disasters to print out. It is the USDA Foods Program Disaster Manual, very detailed. It's about 80 pages long, uh, last updated in 2017. And uh, again, you never know when the power is going to be out and you're going to need your disaster manual. So I recommend printing that out and have it handy if that time is needed. So let's talk about foods that were destroyed during a disaster event. Let's say a hurricane comes in and floods out your central warehouse. Well, USDA does not have the authority to replace foods that are lost, destroyed, contaminated, or otherwise unusual during a disaster event. So now would be a good time to check. First of all, make sure your that particular location, that, let's say that central warehouse, has uh, coverage in their everyday insurance you know, for fire or whatever the case may be. So um, that in some, in some cases, there may be a special rider that you need to add for the value of the food that's stored at that location. So good thing to check in before there's an event um, because USDA cannot replace the foods lost in those types of situations. The other part is that um, from, depending on the circumstances, you may be able to reach out to FEMA to file for a claim for lost foods in that type of a situation. So best practices, prepare, prepare, prepare. That's, that's the key to being, to hit the ground running uh, and not be stalled out when the actual event comes about. And some places, some states seem to have more events than others, but I think it's a good plan, uh, a good idea every year to at least go through the scenario of who is involved in your state and local and make sure you have connections, like I said, the after-hour phone numbers, um, the understanding of whose role applies in what situation, and maybe the, the process of 
that um, you may be involved in, in a larger state event. So just find out who the players are and how your part works. USDA foods normally are not the first choice of food during uh, a disaster event. It's an option, uh, another option to be flexible in the feeding process. So wouldn't be surprised if the, the Red Cross may already have um, contracts in place with other commercial suppliers for food. But if, if those commercial suppliers can't provide uh, foods for their menu, they would reach out and, and look at USDA foods as an option. Again, it's every, every disaster is different, so we have to have these flexibilities in place. Uh, continue to educate local organizations on these how USDA foods can be utilized and also when they're using USDA foods, how they can keep up with the record keeping. They've got to have that paperwork at the very end. Uh, we also encourage states to do annual trainings and to network with maybe even other states. Uh, you might find out that um, there's some things that, that they have in play that would work well in your scenario, you know, especially your neighboring states. So, um, but most of all, it's very important to have that 24-7 contact information. And so here are your resources. I told you earlier about the, the CFR 250, 69, and 250 regulations. Uh, here's your link to your disaster manual, which I'm encouraging you to print out if you don't already have one in, stock, in hand in case the disaster hits and you don't have any electricity to go online and look at it. And your FEMA National Response Framework, it kind of tells you the ESF-6, ESF-11, and how uh, disaster roles play out. And again, FEMA also issues out those very specific um, event numbers on a presidentially declared event. A lot goes on. I think a, many people, like I said earlier, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, FNS is a great resource. If, if, you, if you seem to be confused or you need some assistance, you can reach out to us directly. We want to be a part of it. We want to make sure things are going smoothly and that we can assist in any way uh, ahead of time before it becomes an issue down the road. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Katie. All right, thank you. So we are coming up on the end of our time together today. I want to thank Kathy and Tony for sharing all of this great information. And I want to thank all of our participants for joining us today. Kathy or Tony, would you like to offer any final thoughts before we say goodbye? Thank you to all of you um, for all of your support in the disaster household distributions. And again, um, Tony is available, um, Blair Tucker Grichala and um, David Leggett are also on the disaster team. Um, and as Katie said, thanks for taking time today um, and we're always available for questions.